Right. Uh, welcome to the uh, fourth. Actually, uh, it's last week, and I apologize for the uh, technical difficulties last week. We had a number of issues. Uh, we're trying to set up the hybrid meetings. And today we have an audience in the room here, but also a nice audience on uh, Zoom. So welcome uh, to the fourth uh, Rockwire Lecture Series. Uh, you know, we're holding these series to get people to engage with what we do in the Rockwire open source community. And uh, we wanna get some robust discussion going, not only during the session, but also uh, afterwards, we will be uh, recording this session and putting it on YouTube. So we'll have an archive of this and people can go back and, and watch it, especially if they couldn't make the meeting. Uh, another note is that we have a number of people here from tech services. So our audience is changing every couple of weeks the last two lectures we had were on uh, sort of open source community and uh, on the Illinois app, but now we're shifting gears a little bit to talk about the network edge, you know, where we find ourselves building for applications that you can use on your phone. And it's not magic. You know, there's a lot of technical expertise that goes into these apps. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Robert Belson. Robert Belson works at Verizon. Apparently he was once a, a classical musician and he was very accomplished in that area. And then he became a, a technical person and he's working with Rockwell or working with uh, Verizon. And um, he's uh, sort of an evangelist for, uh, is it uh, AWS? 5G. Yeah, yeah, 5, 5G at AWS. So he's going to tell us about Verizon's approach to this. And he's gonna to try to tie in what we're doing with Rockwire and some of our open source initiatives. Uh, and then related to that, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Illinois Research Park and the Innovation Hub, which is Verizon's presence in the research park and how we might use that as a collaboration point to build open source um, uh, capabilities and talents on Rockwire. So let me pull up his presentation. Let me share my screen here. And uh, it's all yours, Ravi, come on up. Welcome. Kind of cool to do this in person. It's been a while. First and foremost, Dr. Alicia, University of Illinois. Thanks for having me. Um, all coming all the way from New York City. So it's great, great to be back in the Midwest, my second home. Um, and we're really excited to talk a little bit today, not just about 5G Edge, our mobile edge computing platform available today on AWS, but also a little bit more about 5G. All of this. All of these discussions you've probably heard around the evolution of networks, mobile edge computing. Most importantly, what does that mean for the university? What does that mean for students? What does that mean for faculty? And perhaps most importantly, what does that mean for the Rockwire open source community? And how can you get involved today in such a frictionless way? And so we wanna answer all of those questions. And before we do so, maybe a little bit about me. Um, I'm part of our corporate strategy team here at Verizon based out of the New York City area, but I actually lead our developer relations efforts. So what that really means is just working with developers all day long to talk about all of the unique possibilities and experiences afforded by mobile edge computing. I lead our corporate engineering blog, our developer newsletter. We host immersion days, which are like hands-on developer training exercises, hackathons, working with partners. We've hit about a cumulative audience at this point, north of 10,000. We love working with developers hands-on, but also enterprise customers as they come across their enterprise challenges. And prior to Verizon, um, I worked at a blockchain infrastructure startup. So very much a networks distributed systems guy. So I feel like I'm in good company here. But most importantly, I was an academic uh, not too long ago. My uh, research area was all around when life gives you lemons, make lemonade in the context of networks, specifically in-flight Wi-Fi networks, which as we know are very challenging. So how can you manipulate what you perceive to be speed without underlying the network, without altering the underlying connection itself. So I love networks, it's what I do day in, day out, and I'm super, super excited to be here. But by way of an agenda, before we get to 5G Edge, I think we have to understand 5G a little bit better. And to do so, I wanna introduce my uh, partner in crime, Jeff here, who will introduce himself and tell us a little bit more about 5G. Over to you, Jeff. 
Thank you, Robbie. And this is really exciting for us within the university. And I wanted to share some specifics in regards to our philosophy and the best way in here within the University of Illinois is to predict the future is to create it. And we're excited in regards to some of our capabilities within 5G and hoping to support and predict the future is for us to partner with the university and create the future. This was a direct quote that was from our CEO that has that we all have responsibility to drive our great university forward and never had a greater opportunity to elevate this institution. To achieve success, we must embrace new ideas and plan for the long term. All of us must be willing to give up some of the way things we do to reach this future. Along the way, we can never dilute our mission. That is within Verizon's framework in helping support the University of Illinois, not only with the innovation hub, but really the new paradigm that is for learning, which is being remote and capable and connected. And we wanna make sure that within the University of Illinois and within Verizon, that we are also going to help achieve success for the university, embrace new ideas with you, and plan for the long term for connectivity and really embracing the learning pathways for our students here at the University of Illinois and Verizon. Oops. Sorry, went to the wrong slide. So, oops. You saw my quote to you, Yarosh. I have you on there as a presentation piece. Okay. Huh. 5G networks in action. This is obviously some of the capabilities and maybe it would be better for you, Robbie, to kind of jump in because this is more specifically within the networks in action components that are really important within 5G. And I didn't notice some of the presentation slides. <laughs> I know we jumped around a little bit there. Wow, you got a little bit of a, a, a speed tour of everything we're going to be talking about. <laughs> but don't worry, we'll break it down for you piece by piece. Oh, yeah, there, there, there you go. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the currencies of 5G. You've probably heard a lot about it. Basically, it tries to answer the question of what am I going to get with 5G that's different than 4G? And no matter how you look at it, you, it's more than just it's faster. What is speed? And you can think of speed in a number of different ways. You think about latency, the physical time it takes for a packet to get from point A to point B and potentially back. You can also think about it as bandwidth of throughput, the realized essentially size of transmission whereby packets can, uh, can communicate to a, uh, over a point in time. And so the idea is no matter if you're looking at it from a latency perspective or a bandwidth perspective, 5G provides you more. From a latency perspective, the point, the point in which it takes to get from point A to point B is going to be faster. From a bandwidth perspective, you can physically transmit more from point A to point B. But also, the number of, from a device density perspective, you can have more devices connect to that same access point. Mobile data volumes can increase, and all of these other vectors of transformation. But perhaps that made absolutely no sense to you. Let me break it down in a practical example. A lot of people talk about this idea of real-time analytics. Maybe you're a manufacturing plant and you're trying to do some sort of real-time quality assurance. Is this piece of inventory AAC faulty or not? And how you might do that today in an automated system. You, have a, you take a picture of that um, uh, item going through that conveyor belt. You send it over maybe 4G today and somewhere in the cloud, it will process that image and use computer vision to detect if in fact that piece of inventory is defective or not. You can do that today, no problem. But here's what happens over 4G. Let's say the average 4G uplink is something like eight megabits per second on a conservative basis. And that image is something like one megabyte. We're gonna do some basic division here. And this is a low fidelity image. The story only gets more pronounced if that image gets larger. But if we take that one megabyte, we divide it by eight megabits per second. What do we get? A thousand milliseconds. So if we're trying to do any sort of real time analytics, you can't simply by way of the transport latency. If you think about latency, that can mean a number of different things to a number of different people. You can break down the end-to-end -end journey for this workflow in two ways. You have your transport latency, me sending an image to the cloud for computer vision, but then you have the compute latency itself. How long does it take for that computer vision to actually detect, aha, that's defective, or no, it's great. Well, think about it like this. Even if I've optimized that compute latency really, really low, 10 milliseconds, five milliseconds, doesn't matter. The transport latency is so significant that you can't deliver on the promise of real-time insights altogether. But with 5G, without altering a single line of code, here's what can now happen. Same one megabyte image. 
but up to a 250 megabit per second uplink. If we do that same division, that's 32 milliseconds. So what I'm here to tell you is that 5G in this example could save you up to 96% of your latency budget without altering a single line of code. So what that means for you is 5G is a huge opportunity to take existing workflows and make them more performant, not just because it's faster by way of latency, but also because of the bandwidth, the size of that transmission link, of that wireless transmission link. And I think that that's incredibly powerful. Alrighty, I guess let's keep going here. 5G Edge. So we've done a, we've, we've discussed a little bit about 5G and 5G networks. But I think it's important to discuss a little bit more about what can we do beyond just a faster access network by way of 5G. And some of the challenges that I've been seeing over the past few months or so, certainly in light of the pandemic and beyond, what customers, students, faculty may have perceived as good enough six months ago is most certainly not good enough today. Contactless experiences, as we know, are so important. Being able to transact digitally, virtually, as opposed to in person is more important than ever before. We may have been okay exchanging text messages once upon a time, but now we exchange audio and video. We see that the data, um, uh, let's say demands from customers is getting ever higher. But from a cloud computing perspective, where we host our applications hasn't changed very much in the past few years. The cloud is where it is today. And in many cases, it's a best effort service. And so as we think about challenges that customers are having today, it's all around how can we deliver increasingly immersive mobile experiences to these audience that have increasingly data intensive desires and experiences and how can 5G or other things beyond 5G play a role. And so the way that I like to break, break down what motivated us to really build mobile edge computing is the following two perceptions, if you will. If you're a problem, I found that questions you think a lot about are, I believe that there's a relationship between how fast a transaction takes and its impact on my ecosystem by way of conversion. Said differently, there's all this research that suggests things like if a certain website, an e-commerce website as an example, takes 100 milliseconds slower to load a page, that customer may not continue to transact in my platform. They may go somewhere else. And so the questions that product owners often have is, can I make my experience more performant so that I can drive a positive user experience and thus conversion or stickiness to my ecosystem? How can I continue to do that better? Because what was good enough today may not be good enough tomorrow. But from an engineering perspective, which is my background, I think there are a lot of questions around the following. We optimize for corner cases all day. To give you the perfect example, DevOps engineers who deploy applications are always caring for corner cases. That's essentially what they do for a living. What happens if is the question they always answer. What happens if a data center goes down? What happens if a region goes down? What happens if all of my data is lost in a certain region? How do I think about recovery, failover, high availability, all of those challenges? And so think about the mobile edge as just that nth degree of optimization. These DevOps engineers are now saying, well, wait a minute, maybe I can finally improve my mobile experience so that it mirrors that of say a home broadband environment. You often find that there might be a disparity in the experiences you can deliver in the home versus outside the home. How can I create a more uniform experience so that no matter where that customer is, I'm able to deliver that same experience. But on top of that, I only want to do this if I don't have to learn a new language, a new framework, a new set of tools. There's got to be a way to do all of this using the frameworks I know and love. And thus, 5G Edge with AWS Wavelength was born. And I want to talk a little bit more about that, but I think where we always have to start, I've been mentioning things like the mobile edge, compute, 5G Edge. What is the edge? And to, to many people, it can mean a number of different things, and none of them are necessarily wrong. I just want to make sure we define our terms to explain what 5G edge is in our context. And my favorite way to do that is to do a little bit of 5G networks 101. And at the highest level, you have one phone or two phones connected to 4G or 5G networks. Essentially how it works is these phones connect to radios. In a 4G world, they're called enobies. In a 5G world, they're called genobies. And for a given metro area, all of those radios converge to an, uh, an aggregation point, if you will, a data center. And that aggregation point, what it's responsible for doing 
is translating all of this like mobile analog traffic into packets that have IP addresses and can thus communicate with the rest of the world. So at that point, at that very point where you anchor to an IP address is exactly where that compute sits. And here's why this actually matters. As you think about the network and inter the internet in general, it was designed as a best effort service. So as you communicate between one network, say the Verizon mobile network and say the AWS cloud, to get there, you often have to traverse the internet and incur that best effort service. At any given point, you may encounter a router that no longer has space or the buffer to fulfill that packet. So what happens? That packet gets dropped and that client, my phone, wishing to consume this AR app as an example, is forced to retransmit. What does that mean? Latency. Anytime that happens, more latency, slower user experience, all of that. And so the idea is, what if before you incurred that non-determinism associated with the latency, if you could bring the compute within the mobile network? And thus what that meant is even if there was some other cloud endpoint literally in your backyard or right next to me, the mobile edge will still be faster because that's how mobile networks work. They have to go to that first aggregation point, go to that packet core and then leave and potentially go back right to my backyard and thus, that's what motivated us to use that definition of the network edge because it fulfills those low latency requirements, but is geographically broad enough to service larger metro areas. And so it's almost like getting the best of both worlds. And that's exactly what we're offering today in over 13 cities across the US today, including Chicago. And so the idea here at the highest level for those who use AWS today, Within the concept of an AWS region, you can extend your virtual private cloud or VPC to Verizon's care network in all these different cities so that you can have low latency access to all of these different applications. And often questions I get are around, well, what does this actually mean for me? And I think there's three big takeaways. What does mobile edge computing mean to you and what are the benefits? First and foremost, we optimize the network. So you don't have to, said differently. If everything I said about packet core and user plane function and enodebs make no sense to you, well, that's fine because our job is to optimize the complexities of the network itself. Your job is to build your applications and use the platform you know and love and let us take care of the complexities of the network via all of these really nifty software abstractions that remind you of the AWS environment you know and love. Similarly, you don't wanna to have to use this other platform and you don't want to have to manage these edge resources separate from everything else. So the beauty of working with Verizon 5G Edge with AWS Wavelength is when you go to your AWS console, it's just right there. When you manage all of your virtual machines, edge and non-edge are presented together. And on top of that, any service that isn't natively supported today on Wavelength, you can seamlessly access via the rest of AWS. And all of this extends to all 13 Wavelength zones across two regions in the US today. And so altogether, if you think about the way that we've been able to optimize the complexities of the network itself, the seamless management and the broad geographic access, there's really no better time than now to get started. And I'm so excited to share a few of my initial thoughts on how the Rockwire platform can support these very services from a broader business impact. And of course, from the engineering perspective. Um, and as we start to think about what that impact would look like, I like to talk about edge enablement journeys, or rather, how do you get started? And how do I do so in the most seamless and frictionless way? And ways that I often like to describe it is, so you've built your app, now what? You've built a web app and it needs to run somewhere in the cloud or otherwise. You start with the infrastructure, meaning extending your existing virtual private cloud environment or building one net new and extend it to AWS Wavelength. Now, you're seeing here on the slide Azure Stack, what does that mean? What that means is that we have different flavors of mobile edge computing. I'm going to focus today primarily on public mobile edge computing, what runs on top of the Verizon commercial mobile network. But if you're managing, say, a manufacturing plant, a private network, we have an opportunity to deploy essentially purpose-built hardware within your facility by way of Azure Stack. So just giving customers flexibility like never before for what mobile edge computing means to them. But I'm gonna to focus today on AWS Wavelength because it's broadly accessible 
anybody can just go into the AWS console and build. But worth noting that we have public mobile edge computing and private mobile edge computing. And together, this is our 5G edge portfolio. AWS Wavelength is just one such example. So after you think about your infrastructure, where should this thing live? What makes sense? Is this tethered to a private network or is this more a public network use case? Then you have to start thinking about routing and all these networking challenges that you may not have thought about. And here's a really cool problem statement, one that Verizon has solved, but one worth thinking about. In a world where you have all of these different locations for where you can deploy applications, say you have 13 different choices, where before you had four, how do you make the decision? I know for an example, I'm near Chicago, so I'd want to connect to the Chicago Wavelength Zone. My phone doesn't necessarily know it's in Chicago. So Verizon created an API to help with these routing decisions. And what's so cool about this is if we borrow or steal from the airline um, industry, when they say things like the closest exit may be behind you, so too in networks. It could very well be that there's a bottleneck in some location or an event triggered such that the closest wavelength zone may not necessarily be that which you're currently residing in from a geography perspective. Or simply put, you don't have a workload there. You're not running anything in, in Chicago. You're only running it in Dallas as, as an example. These types of decisions Verizon can help you with using this easy to use API, which can be deeply integrated with the Rockwire platform. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit here. And of course, for IoT applications, we have our ThingSpace platform, a rich set of APIs to register devices, track geolocation, all of that great stuff. And everything I'm talking about here, this is real living, breathing code. If you go to github.com slash Verizon slash 5G edge tutorials, I manage that repo. We have automation templates using the SDK, Software Development Kit, CDK, Cloud Development Kit, Cloud Formation, which is their managed infrastructure as code service on AWS, Terraform, open source equivalent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of the building blocks you see here are well documented on GitHub for anybody to get started on. Well, you can just get started right on AWS. And it's worth noting that every single day we make impressions on thousands of developers. I just took a little screenshot here from the console. You see Verizon front and center. And working together with the A with AWS and exposing all of this compute capability through their console, it's really that easy to just get started. It has to do with doing something you would already start with, having a logical networking environment for your resources, the virtual private cloud. Then when you want to connect to one of these Verizon edge zones, AWS calls it AWS Wavelength. So in the same way today as a virtual private cloud, otherwise known as a bunch of IP addresses that are yours for you to manage, you slice and dice them into a series of subnets, logical partitions of these spaces for public resources and private resources, potentially across a broad geography. You would extend one of those subnets to a wavelength zone seamlessly in the console. And then for any resources you want to expose directly to the carrier network, use something called a carrier IP address, much like a public IP address. Everything you see here is just baked into services you know and love, such as EC2, Elastic Compute Cloud for your core virtual machines that you're using today, and the Amazon VPC or virtual private cloud service that really sort of underpins all applications today. So that's a little bit about AWS and the infrastructure. I know that was a lot, so let's zoom out a little bit and talk about, well, maybe you're not a developer, so why should I care? And more importantly, you talk about how fast this is, how fast. So I wanted to show you wasn't the best example of 5G edge. I didn't want to do one that necessarily isn't fair to isolating the benefits of 5G edge itself. Simply put, what I could have done is showed you an example versus 4G and the core cloud versus 5G and 5G edge. But in my mind, that'd be cheating. You would see a ridiculous order of magnitude um, increase in performance. What I wanted to do instead is be intellectually honest. And what I did is the following. I want to take the fastest possible 5G network out there, our 5G ultra wideband network, and create that as essentially a control variable. And then isolate the benefits of these wavelength zones of 5G itself. And what you're seeing is a really nifty application that I built with the help of AWS. There are these cool applications on Android devices where you can um, essentially divide your phone in half. So on the top half of the screen, on either side, you're seeing my camera app facing a millisecond clock. So I think it says here 624 and 52 seconds. The bottom half of my screen is the stream of the millisecond clock. So I set up essentially an RTMP streaming endpoint in the cloud and at the edge. So they're racing essentially. And what you can do at any given point in time is you can look and see what does the clock look like on the top 
And what does the clock look like on the bottom? To isolate the end-to-end -end delay associated with each of these endpoints, thus telling us how much faster is the edge than the cloud. And what you're seeing here is you might think, oh, 5G edge might save me 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. Try 1,000. And that's what we're seeing here, that application context matters. And even in the fastest of 5G networks, you're still going to see a very significant performance increase in using the mobile edge. And yes, the mobile edge matters. It's not a 5G or 5G edge. It's an and story. It's a 5G and 5G edge story. And I think that's a critically important piece that it's all about when you think about measuring performance, measuring it relative to that next best alternative. So what you don't want to be doing is saying, ah, I'm looking for X milliseconds from my application. That's not a good way to look at it. Too many variables are at play depending on where you are, where are you connecting, and where is that next best alternative that you're measuring. So instead, what we encourage developers to do is be honest with what your application, real application traffic, as you see here, not just a network ping, measure that experience, and then measure what you would get if you didn't have the mobile edge at your disposal. And conducting that intellectual exercise, you're going to see performance benefits, much like you see here. I do want to remind everyone, I feel like I've been doing a lot of talking here. Please feel free to throw questions here in the chat feature. I, uh, I should have access, would love to answer any questions. I know I'm going fairly quickly. Um, but please don't be shy. would love to answer any questions that folks are having. And certainly at the end, I'll be passing in a bunch of resources that you can visit to learn more, to get started. Um, we do a number of these webinar type experiences. We call them immersion days for developers. We've also done a number of these forums for a less technical audience as well. So whatever you're looking for, we've done it and we're happy to share those links with the team here. Um, I see we're still doing well on time, so I'll keep going here. We talked a little about infrastructure, going back to the edge enablement journey. We talked about infrastructure. But remember, there were two other pieces. There was IoT and device management, which by and large today we can cover at a different session. I want to focus more on broad consumer applications. But I want to talk a little bit about the edge discovery service and more importantly, network intelligence. Because as I believe the cloud computing landscape involves, there will be other edge offerings. Edge computing isn't something that Verizon invented. In fact, there was a professor at um, uh, Carnegie Mellon who first, uh, uh, I believe, posited this notion of edge computing. Um, and it was referred to as cloudless um, and then further evolved into fog computing. And now we're at edge computing. So this isn't a new idea. But what I think is unique from a Verizon perspective is network intelligence. That we have a unique opportunity to leverage the mobile network to provide network intelligence that others may not be able to do. And by creating APIs and exposing services that connect mobile network to network infrastructure to cloud infrastructure, we can do some really cool things. And as one such example, we briefly mentioned this idea of all of these different choices for where to connect to, how does my phone know? Well, certainly the edge discovery service can help you identify the optimal wavelength zone. If I'm in Boston, go to Boston. If I'm in Atlanta, go to Atlanta. If I'm in Seattle, go to Seattle those types of decisions, but it doesn't just stop there. Here's what, I, here's what gets me really excited. If we start to use these APIs in a broader context, let's say you've built a Rockwire application using that open source platform that's designed for a number of different schools, but perhaps it's unique to a specific event like a, um, a sports game. And let's assume that this is a week of college football that has games on Saturday, but also Friday. And also, I think I've seen one like on Wednesday, maybe on Thursday. Yes, unique, but imagine the scenario for a second. As an infrastructure team, you only want to pay for what you use, and that's a tremendous benefit of 5G Edge, much like AWS. You pay for the infrastructure you use, and when you're not using that infrastructure, you may as well shut it down from a cost-effectiveness perspective. But how do you know if a bunch of universities all across the country are using this? It's too way too cumbersome to try to do this manually. Aha, a game's happening here, launch infrastructure there. A game is happening in the Northeast, launch it there. A game is happening in the Southeast, launch it there. Way too complicated. Well, instead, if you can tie that network intelligence back to, I know generally where the closest wavelength zone is to these clients, irrespective of whether there's a workload there, you can start to connect network intelligence to application intelligence. Said differently, you can go to the, as you think about, perhaps you've heard of this idea of the thin client, as phones have less and less intelligence, become less bulky, and you're offloading compute and intelligence to the cloud, 
Well, now the cloud, if you will, could be the mobile network, now starting to make decisions around, aha, I've seen a bunch of users who would actually desire, because they're, um, uh, they're at the State Farm Arena, that they, that they want to connect to the Chicago Wavelength Zone because it's closest, but the only workload we have is servicing a different university for their football game in Boston. Well, we should remedy that. And you as the developer, don't worry about that. We'll deploy on your behalf because it's the same app. So it's cool ways where you can start to say network intelligence, application intelligence are now one. And that's a uniquely a Verizon capability that we can position and real APIs that we're offering and starting to connect to the dots today. Just wanted to pique your interest with that piece. One more idea here, and that's all about enhancing the campus tour experience. So I really wanted to start thinking about before we jump into the Rockwire platform itself, what am I getting excited about as I think about 5G Edge and university experiences? And I remember distinctly not too long ago when I was going on college tours, it was a hassle. How do I know where to go? How do I prioritize? It's expensive. Um, I don't want to rely on virtual um, tours. I find Zoom is rather boring. It won't hold my attention. I certainly won't apply there, but now it's even worse today. Now there's a fear of even necessarily traveling on top of justifying the investment itself. So the question I'm sure many found themselves asking is, man, there's got to be a better way than just Zoom to tour a college campus from the comfort of your home and see that iconic campus building or sports stadium. Boy, if I could see the replay of that ninth overtime game from the cover of my home, I'm applying. Um, so we're working with a company by the name of Atho um, that's offering an app called BMXR that they built for Wavelength. And here's essentially what it does, as you can see on the left-hand side of your screen here. Yes, it's available for VR, but it's also available for just a smartphone. And so the idea is from the comfort of your home, a tour guide from campus would guide you through the campus tour, much like they would do with Zoom. But instead of having to stare at a screen, you could just use your smartphone and within the comfort of your home, as you see here, a statue would just suddenly appear. A really high fidelity 3D model that you could interact with, that you could twist around, that you could ask questions about. You could have all of these rich assets that you're directly interacting with without going anywhere. And so not only that the performance benefits using 5G Edge pronounced, as you can see on the bottom side of the screen, they saw a 63% latency improvement, but there's actually an ROI story from a university campus perspective. And I got this from the uh, Atho team themselves. Let's just assume the average um, application fee is around $43. A school would generate a positive return from this platform as long as one student in every 100 just applies to the school in light of the experience. So what I love about working with customers now is I don't just play the role as an engineer. We think a lot about the strategic impact to organizations. And something like this, where you can pair a why story from a business impact perspective, from a technical impact perspective, and the fact that the application is pretty nifty in and of itself, this, this type of stuff gets me really excited and would love to discuss more in the Q&A here. One, that's correct. So we're um, uh, currently Atho today is working with Morehouse College and HBCU based out of the Atlanta area, and they're using the Atlanta Wavelength Zone. But in the context of U of I, you would use the um, you would use the Chicago Wavelength Zone. But on top of that, if you are a um, let's say I'm touring and I'm going back to New York City, so I wanted to potentially apply to University of Illinois, but I'm living in New York City and I can't travel to Chicago, the act of streaming that back to me could also happen through that New York City wavelength zone. So you have to think about not just the ingest of assets, but the distribution of assets. And that's another opportunity where 5G Edge plays a role. But moving beyond potentially this one use case, I do wanna mention that for students and faculty, that's, this is the opportunity that gets me equally excited because what I love to do is host dedicated immersion days for students. And the idea is simple. You just take two hours on a Wednesday, Thursday evening, to learn a little bit more hands-on how to use this. We have all these fun little getting started guides. You can build your first hot dog versus not hot dog app for those of you who watch Silicon Valley or a WebRTC streaming app or an IoT um, um, uh, MQTT broker app. We have all these fun little labs that are packaged up, which it, it follows often an hour long training session for everything you need to know with AWS. You leave this session having built an app, learning everything you need to know about mobile edge computing, and then all of the resources to connect back with us, should you wanna build something more involved, say with the Rockwire platform. I see a tremendous opportunity 
to use this to build on 5G Edge. And beyond that, as we think about immersion days as a service, we've been starting to think about, well, maybe the two hour program isn't enough. And we've started to build out this initiative here where we're creating an eight week series for all of the different topics uh, uh, that you're seeing here. Everything from network architecture considerations, security, high availability, essentially taking that AWS well-architected lens and applying it to becoming not just proficient with our 5G edge infrastructure, but the network APIs, the integration with the network as a whole, IoT, everything. And this type of program, at least the immersion days themselves, we've already hit over 1,700 engineers. And we'd love the opportunity to come back and do it again. Tell the, tell you, the students, faculty, and beyond, and the Rockwire community what we do, how we do it, and how you can take advantage of the applications today. And before I turn it over to Abhijit, I want to close with one thing I've been thinking about this morning. Um, for those of you who are involved at a code block level or the engineers in the Rockwire community, I was doing some, uh, let's say, high level digging around on the GitHub, on GitHub, looking at Rockwire open source. I saw the, um, uh, the code that was contributed in Dart. I've done a little bit of work in uh, Angular, React, Kotlin, spent a little less time on the front end, but then I saw your Rockwire building blocks API um, repo, and that started to get me thinking. If you have all these baseline set of services dealing with authentication, event streaming, et cetera, they're already containerized and you already have instructions on that repo for how it works on AWS, well, I have fantastic news for you. You can move all of that immediately without lifting a finger to AWS Waypoint, and here's how. AWS loves creating seamless integrations across all of their infrastructure. They call it the cloud continuum. They don't really want you to care or think about where you're deploying it from the perspective of the developer. It's just another location or availability zone. And a container in location A should perform the same way as location in container B. So essentially, with all of these repos here, the instructions are something like, refactor this module that I've created for you for authentication containerize it and upload it to ECR, which is the Elastic Container Registry. Well, guess what? If you wanna deploy that container on 5G Edge or AWS Wavelength, all you do is from that virtual machine at the edge or your container, I'm sorry, your Kubernetes cluster or ECS cluster, you just say, aha, get my container from there and run it. And that's your, and, and, and your configuration uh, files and manifests, you update it as such and it just works. And I've done this many, many, many times. I didn't even realize that all of this code was containerized. So what that means for us as we work together, allow this to be an open invitation to the Rockwire community. Let's build something together. Let's take either an existing application using that, those backend set of APIs and moving a subsection of those APIs to the edge to evaluate performance, or let's work on building a net new application together. Because the opportunity has never been better to build at the edge for one, and you've already taken such fantastic, tremendous steps to make that edge enablement journey easier. And more broadly here at Verizon, we're here for you in that edge enablement journey for the Rockware community, for the students, for the faculty. We look forward to continuing the partnership. I'm so excited to have had the chance to, uh, to be here today. And uh, I'd love to save questions to the end while I turn it over to Abhijit to talk a little bit more about the Innovation Hub. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, Rob. Uh, can we hear you, Abhijit? Yeah, I can. Hopefully, you guys can hear me. I'm unmuted now. So, well, uh, fantastic uh, presentation, uh, Robbie. That was uh, um, hopefully. Can you, can you hear me, guys? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear Abhijit. Um, Hold on. Yeah, I don't know if we can hear him. For, oh, well, I, I can um, hear yeah. Are you I, muted, Abhijit, or are you able to say something? Um, can you? Can I guess you hear he's me talking. Now? I can't hear him for some reason. We've had this problem before. Okay. Can you? Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well. Um, can yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Could you put him on speaker on yours? Okay. We'll, we'll listen to uh, yeah. uh, the speaker okay. on Hiroshi's phone. Okay, yeah, um, I, I'm able to hear everybody and you should be able to hear me now. Okay. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, great, thank you. 
Hey, uh, so uh, thanks everyone. Um, Robbie, fantastic presentation. Um, hopefully that was uh, very useful um, to this community that's attending today. Um, as far as you know, how 5G um, technology is working very closely with edge computing technology uh, provided with some, uh, by some of our partners like Amazon and Microsoft. Um, this a section of the presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's really going on um, on campus. So um, in October of 2020, uh, we uh, launched a Verizon Innovation Hub at the University of Illinois. It is in the Research Park uh, Enterprise Works building. We occupy one uh, space in one of the one of the rooms um, in Enterprise Works, and uh, you what you see here is a few pictures of uh, of uh, what we have there. So um, uh, it, it looks kind of like uh, if you look at the right picture, it looks like there's just a room, right? But no, um, there is actually a cell tower in there um, that provides a full. Um, ultra wideband millimeter wave signal. So what that means is that th this is the special thing about 5G technology as opposed to the previous generations of cellular technology, which operated only in the lower frequency ranges. Okay, so it's called a sub six range. Um, 4G, the, 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 which you use and you love, uh, is um, operating in the sub six bands, like in the 2.5, 2.4 gigahertz, ranges, um, uh, whereas with 5G, um, a much more higher frequency spectrum was introduced as part of the standards uh, when 5G uh, was deployed. And uh, 5G actually operates in like in um, the millimeter wave, so which is uh, around 30 gigahertz, like so there's one signal at 28 uh, gigahertz um, and then there's another um, signal at 39 gigahertz. The one in the lab is at 39 gigahertz. Um, it, um, so this, the thing is with 5G was also, also introduced something called ultra wideband. Okay, so normally um, 4G technology uses about say 10 megahertz of spectrum um, and offers a certain bandwidth. If you know something about the physics behind um, you know, bandwidth and speed, um, the bandwidth limits, the that provides the physical limits for the speed. So uh, in 10 megahertz, um, you know, you, not a lot of speed was possible. Maybe with uh, multiple carriers combined together, you could get 300 to 400 megabits per second with 4G. With 5G, you're going to get one gigabits per second, okay, uh, on a 100 megahertz band, because now we're using a much wider band. Um, one thing about this lab is, it is meant as a um, enabler for a test bed for um, test case validation or use case validation. So the way we engage this lab with companies that are in the UIUC area. Uh, so they're partners in the um, UIUC research bar. There's about 140 companies, including uh, about 30 Fortune 500 ranked companies and the rest of them are medium sized and startups. Um, we uh, go through a process of use case discovery, like we try to see if there's a fit for 5G um, for their particular current business operation driven use cases. Could be in manufacturing, could be in, um, in um, you know, in uh, analytics uh, of data collected from consumers. It could be like um, IoT type applications, which would be, um, you know, collecting um, data from farms or robots that are operating on farms. Um, it could be, um, you know, uh, monitoring livestock. You know, we've seen all these in discussions with various companies at, um, at UIUC Research Park. I've seen these type of use cases. Um, and so uh, since this is a test bed platform uh, that we are offering here, it's, it's technically uh, what we categorize as private. Okay, so what that means is if uh, one of the companies, let's say, wants to do some test case validation here in this lab, we give them a special SIM It's uh, with private connectivity. We've got um, our 5G core also sitting in this building. Okay, we've actually installed a 5G network core. Uh, normally, these network cores, in addition to what's called the radio access network, which is the cell tower, okay, the core uh, of the Verizon um, overall nationwide Verizon network, there are 
um, the core is installed at what are called service access points. And these are nationwide, they're all, and Chicago has a service access point. Um, and that's where the AWS wavelength edge sits, right at the service access point. But what we've done in this lab is that we've actually created a service access point right inside the lab and we can, and we are planning uh, very soon to add a private version of an edge compute environment over there, okay? So, um, so that's how we differentiate. Now we also have public access uh, around Memorial Stadium, which is um, a, actually, actually a single cell tower, which is providing that millimeter wave signal. Um, it also provides a sub six version of 5G that Verizon operates nationwide. Um, which shares spectrum with 4G, okay? So when a company comes and tells us, hey, we, we have a use case where we want to actually try out the benefits of 5G on a public network, we can enable that by having their device connect to like the one single tower we have on Memorial Stadium and they can run their application at the edge like how Robbie was describing um, uh, right in the AWS wavelength zone in Chicago, okay? Now, Chicago isn't like right in Urbana-Champaign, it's 200 miles away. So you're going to, you, you probably are gonna see a little more latency, but you'll still see the benefits, okay? Of connecting from Urbana-Champaign to Chicago, okay? Um, whereas if they're even earlier stage in their prototyping or whatever, and they wanna try out things in a lab, so they're simulating a device in the lab, let's say they, they, we, we give them a 5G modem, Okay, and they can hook up the modem to a laptop. Okay, and you know they're simulating some sort of an IoT application. They can do this in the lab. Okay, and we can run, have them run their edge application instance right in the lab. Okay, and so uh, the latency there would be expected to be like maybe ten milliseconds or something. No, that it's, a, it's that low. Okay, if they if they do it in this private uh, sequestered environment. Uh, but there's a choice, you know, and there are certain restrictions like, you know, some of the companies have farm equipment that they want to connect with a 5G modem. And, um, you know, there, it's impossible to bring like a heavy tractor into the lab, right? So in that case, uh, you know, uh, connecting through the Memorial Stadium, stadium uh, signal uh, makes more sense. Okay. So um, that's, uh, we have, uh, you know, immediate short-term plans to bring up a private mech. Um, VNS, it's called a VNS app edge um, in our lab, um, that, which will en enable that private edge compute environment um, validation and test case testing, okay? Um, we will offer all the tools uh, for performance metrics. You know, we can measure uh, speeds and latency. We already have those tools uh, available. Um, so, uh, you know, people can actually see the benefits of this um, uh, technology, okay, with 5G and edge. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, great. Um, so, um, you know, I just want to quickly go over, I think I already talked about some of this, but uh, we've uh, looked at use cases involving AR, VR, both, um, you know, both the uplink capture of uh, AR, VR content, the processing of that content, and then the delivery of that content um, in real time, okay? Which improves the performance of an AR VR application, whether it's an AR VR headset or it, it's a smartphone, right? You could do uh, virtual reality on either one, right? So, but then um, the user experience is different with a headset. Um, so another example is IoT where uh, most of the IoT we've seen is um, in, um, manufacturing, uh, I'm sorry, in field operations for farm equipment, we have companies like Caterpillar on campus, Caterpillar and John Deere and um, some others, Atco, I believe. So th these companies are basically looking to collect engine diagnostics uh, for tractor equipment and doing predictive maintenance. Um, some of them are actually um, interested in AR, VR application for uh, re equipment repair. You know, so um, they send a technician out there, he wears a VR headset or has a smartphone and he's doing repair. He gets all this um, AR information superimposed on the stream um, that helps um, um, them troubleshoot problems in the field, right? So um, that's an example. So IoT also involves like, uh, you know, there was one use case where 
um, you know, companies interested in uh, equipping livestock like cows and, you know, uh, with sensors so that they can track their movements, they can track their vitals. Um, you know, and make sure there's no disease and things like that, right? And all this needs analytics platform and, and analytics engine running at the edge. And um, uh, like Rob, Rob, you was saying, you can run this analytics um, at the edge. Um, you can enable high volumes of data transfer through sensor information. You can, um, you can do it in a distributed manner so that, you know, if I'm a farmer, and I have 10 fields uh, in Illinois near the Champaign area, but they're not exactly all in the same. They're not like contiguous, like they could be distributed in 20 different locations, right? Um, and so I could in theory put a uh, private mech on each of my farms, you know, now that's expensive. I'm not saying it's still there yet from, a, you know, from an economics perspective, uh, but uh, the farmer could put a mech, um, like a single container mech, you know, uh, right there on each of his farms and uh, provide, which will provide the analytics real time and provide notifications and alerts, which makes the operation extremely efficient, right? Um, another application is um, uh, in manufacturing. We've seen cognitive video as, again, um, using AI and uh, machine learning methods um, that can be hosted at the edge. Um, in a similar fashion where now you're collecting uh, video streams in a single location, okay? So location, the, the contiguousness of location matters here, right? It's, so uh, it's either that you're in one location and you have a huge bandwidth need or you're in a distributed uh, type of uh, situation like the farms um, where you, you, a single farm may not give you a lot of, uh, you know, bandwidth requirement, but collectively it's huge, right? So um, in this case, it's uh, imagine it's a factory, the factory, um, um, you know, a, a production center where um, there's an assembly line and um, the edge framework is now sitting right in the factory. Um, there is a 5G signal in the factory. There's 25 cameras or 24 cameras collecting video streams from various points on the assembly line. It is also sending diagnostics in information from robots that are participating in the assembly. All this data is being collected, streamed um, to the edge, okay? And the, the beauty of 5G is because it's a service-based architecture, which is going to be deployed soon. It's called a standalone architecture. The core has a total different uh, sort of, uh, very partition type of functionality with APIs, okay? So, which was not possible with 4G technology. Uh, with 5G standalone core, there are APIs that control network slices. You can actually say that this slice is carrying video traffic. I need a certain error rate on this traffic. I need a certain bandwidth on this traffic versus uh, this other uh, slice of the network, of the wireless network is actually carrying IoT traffic, which is more bursty. It's random, um, but it needs to be accurate. No. So uh, 5G service-based architecture is going to enable those APIs for applications, okay? So um, an application will sit at the edge uh, or in the parent cloud, they can call APIs uh, that will control or demand network slicing. Mm. We will work with companies that are developing applications to make them aware that network as a service, which is enabled through the service-based architecture of 5G is going to be a possibility for these applications, okay? And uh, we're also engaging with Rockfire on creating apps um, uh, and fan, for fan experiences at Memorial Stadium. And uh, we're very excited about, you know, uh, engaging with this uh, open source platform, fantastic. So that's all I had today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any questions or good? Yeah, thank you, Abhijit. Um, yeah, so let's go to the chat, see if there are questions. Uh, okay, I think we had just some comments here on who can hear. Okay, so do we have any questions uh, for either Robert or Abhijit on their initiatives? You can put them in the chat. I know we're running close to the end of the hour. So, um, you know, perhaps if you have further questions, you can contact me. Um, 
at war, you know, you can even, I can put you in touch with them if you have a more directed question. Uh, again, you know, there's the um, uh, innovation hub at the research park. So if you're on campus here, you know, you might want to check out the activities at the research park more generally, but also with uh, respect to the innovation hub at Enterprise Works. And um, if people have like ideas that they've kind of formed in their heads during this talk, uh, please, you know, let us know. We can we can have a conversation beyond the confines of this talk. Uh, we'd love to, you know, discuss some collaborations or potential ideas for other types of things. Or, you know, if you have, if you don't agree with what they're saying here, um, you know, there are people from tech services here who might disagree with some of this, but if, if you do, you know, we can always have that conversation later, so. Do we have any additional questions? I'll ask a question. Okay. I'll ask a question and then answer it. Okay, go ahead. Can I, can I, is there a way to type in the chat? Uh, a few yeah, if you go to the chat here. I feel like one of the main questions that I would at least ask is, I wanna learn more, but I don't wanna reach out to Robbie directly. So how might I do that? And there's a bunch of different ways to do that. I'd say the first place to start is verizon.com slash 5G edge. This is, a, this is a link that will redirect you to our homepage for all things mobile edge computing. And right at the top, you'll see a, a place that's developed that says developer resources. So everything you need there from links to pretty much every single developer conference and developer training that I've recently spoken at is there. Our developer newsletter, which comes out once a month, you can learn about the latest feature updates, um, opportunities to be featured directly in the newsletter itself. So I'm looking at you, all the developers building Rockwire apps, you build on 5G edge. Yep. Oh, whoops. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. So Verizon.com slash 5G Edge is opportunity number one. What I was saying is you build an app um, using the Rockwire platform on 5G Edge, the developer newsletter is a great way to feature um, you and your work. But also we spend a lot of time our blog. If you go to Verizon 5G Edge blog dot medium dot com, you find all of the latest um, uh, reflection pieces from community, tutorials, all of that great stuff. And generally, if you want to contact me directly, don't be shy. I'll pop my email in here. We'd love to have a discussion more broadly on use cases, on architecture, try to stump me on our network APIs, whatever that might be. We are here to help. And could you put the uh, email for, for the web address for the open source repository? Ah, yes, yes, good idea. GitHub.com. So you go to github.com slash Verizon slash 5G Edge Tutorials is where you find everything. Tutorials. Um, you'll see that it's all sorted by function. So you'll see stuff dealing with cloud formation, things with a software development kit. It's uh, very well documented, but of course, any questions, feel free to reach out. All righty. That's the only question I have for myself. Okay. <laughs> very good. So thank you for attending and thank you. Robert for presenting and thank you Abhijit and their emails are in the chat here. And so uh, thank you for attending everyone. See you next week. We're going to talk about data trusts. We're going to have uh, Angela talk about data trusts and I will be sending on invite or, or you know, the uh, abstract for next week. Thank you.